Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Farmer Walker MP, MP for Cone Valley, West Georgia, where we have lots of hills and sheep and rain, I have to say. Um, I'm also John McDonald's uh, Parliamentary Private Secretary, and I'm hoping that John will be joining us uh, sometime through this session. Uh, in which case, if he walks through the door, I'll let him just take over. So, I, first of all, I do apologise for not being John. Um, but what I don't apologise for is I'm a member of the Education Select Committee. Um, and I was also, before being elected um, to be an MP, um, I was a teacher and head teacher for 34 years. Um, so, I'm absolutely delighted um, to be here with you. Um, and a part of this conversation with you, and hopefully future conversations, um, because uh, neurodiversity and inclusion is something very, very close to my heart. Um, as a teacher, for 30 odd years, I worked so hard to have an inclusive classroom um, and, to, and to have a whole child education. Um, and as a head teacher, I worked so hard with staff. Um, and children and parents to have an inclusive school. And um, one of the things that I did um, as a head teacher um, was when we were planning the curriculum, when we were planning activities, um, we used to do a preferred learning style. And we were one of the few schools that did that and um, did this. And what we did was we started with the staff about how they preferred to teach and how they preferred to learn because very often that had an impact on what happened in the classroom and um, because if you had a teacher that was, was very kind of didactic very controlled very formal obviously within a class of say 34 or so each and every child and young person is different and has that preferred learning style and so you may have heard of VAC which is the visual auditory kinesthetic um, and preferred way of, of learning. And, um, and so we used to find out about each child in the school. We asked them the questions and we talked to them about, you know, how do you prefer to learn this? Do you prefer to go outside and do this? Um, or would you, prefer, would you prefer to sit with a partner and do this? Or which, would you prefer to listen to something? Would you prefer to do it? So we used to do this um, VAC audit and it was so important to do it with the teachers so that we knew how the teachers preferred to learn, and that tailored how they taught. Um, and so, as I say, this is something that's very, very dear to my heart in terms of having that whole child inclusive education in schools. So, what do we say then in terms of a centre and a school? What do we say to the staff in that school about how do you make learning, how do you make life inclusive? <coughs> and as a party, our party is one of diversity and inclusion and Labour is home to anyone who believes in a fairer society and that's what we're here for. That's what this whole conference for me is about. It's about a fairer society. And we're united by a common purpose of social justice and we're working and campaigning to improve lives, everybody's lives through quality education, as I mentioned, I'm a member of the Education Select Committee, and we're working on inquiries to, you know, to improve the lives of, of, of every young person. Um, meaningful employment, which is fully funded, and accessible healthcare as well, because it's all joined up, isn't it? It's not just about what happens in schools, it's about the nature of our healthcare, um, it's public health as well. Um, and after <coughs> almost 10 years in the Conservative government, we've still such a lot of work to do. So there's also so much to say about the effect uh, austerity and conservative policies have had on our schools. And I could talk for an hour just on the, on the schools, but it's on hospitals and it's on our, in our whole communities. But in particular, they've had a very real and devastating impact on those with disabilities who are neurodiverse or have special educational needs. And as a SENCO, as I say, that's very close to my heart. I, I was a SENCO for 12 years. And, and actually, you know, working with local authority officers and trying to get that funding and trying to get that support uh, for families and for children was one of the biggest challenges as a teacher and head teacher and SENCO. In some areas, and you'll know about this, diagnostic services are sparse. Services to support those who are diagnosed have been victim of 
financial pressures. And too often, help has only been given after someone has been left until they are in critical need. NICE guidelines say that assessments for autism should take place within three months of the referral. Well, I've got people and families coming into my advice surgeries and they've been waiting 18 months sometimes. And you'll have your own stories to tell, I'm sure, about that. Figures were released in July of this year which showed that some people have had to wait for two years for an assessment and then almost four to receive a diagnosis. Meanwhile, those who are waiting are plagued with uncertainty and have limited access to support. And I think this is truly, truly shocking. People's lives are in limbo without support. <coughs> and those who have been diagnosed and need welfare support face the government's cruel and punishing policies, sanctions, delayed payments and interviews which misunderstand conditions that are a common experience. In the last 12 months in my office, we've been contacted by many PIP universal credit applicants who have suffered unfair rulings or been shaken by the whole assessment process. I think the whole assessment process just needs a big overhaul. So it's no surprise that a significant number of those who are neurodiverse or have a disability develop mental health conditions such as depression or anxiety, which come with their own waiting times for assessment and diagnosis. It's a heartbreaking pattern of waiting times and a lack of proper support. That's why our work, Labour's work on this, is so important. There needs to be a better understanding of the issues faced by people who are neurodiverse and a developed approach to put into action when, and remember, when a Labour government is elected to de deliver inclusive change in all areas of life, from employment to education to housing and beyond. Today, I want to hear from you about the barriers to equal participation which have limited the neurodiverse population in society, education, healthcare and work. Your experiences, your thoughts, your concerns. I want to hear about how our manifesto would benefit communities, families and individuals. How these changes would overcome barriers, giving everyone the best chance in life regardless of their circumstances. We're here to listen to you, to your voices and the voices of the neurodiverse population across the UK. I agree with the slogan, nothing about us without us. I think it's perfect. It's a principle to prioritise the voice of the neurodivergent people in the development of policies and changes to improve diagnosis and provision. It's imperative that Labour's plans for inclusive change on neurodiversity are informed by those affected the most. So I look forward to hearing more throughout the course of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we, are, um, we are in the presence of all our guest speakers and our um, steering group speakers now. So we, I think... Is John McDonald yes, yes. Is in the room, as they say? Shall we yes. yes. <laughs> He's not left the building. He's not left the building. <laughs> um, so thank you for Hello, coming. Um, we have Richard Reiser. Um, Reza, Reza, sorry, Reza. You say Reza, I say... Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's what comes of online communications, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, Emma Dalmain, um, Janine Booth, and Mark Sorot... Sor do you see, I can't say that. I'm sorry, Mark. Mark, so, thank you. Mark Sorokka and um, Austin Harney. And obviously, I'll pipe in a little bit, but as little as possible. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is indeed Austin um, Aust Harney. Yeah, Austin Harney, um, Secretary of the Labour Party Audits and Neurodiversity Steering Group. But I'm also on the National Executive Committee for the PCS Union as well. Um, I'll just begin just to give a brief background about myself. I mean, I was diagnosed with quasi-autism at the age of four, taught by the top doctors in the world, I was in the mainstream society. I'll keep that brief, I won't go into much detail, and I consider that time is a very important factor at this meeting. Um, but I think what we need to be also clear about, um, I don't know how many people have even heard the term of quasi-autism, <coughs> because you see, Asperger's syndrome didn't exist in those days when I was diagnosed. I'm talking the early 70s, so I didn't want to give away my age this evening. <laughs> but um, it wasn't actually uh, recognised until 1994. Um, what happened was Leo Kanner discovered autism uh, in America, 
but actually Hans Asperger, he put forward a paper the following year, 1944, uh, for about mild forms of autism, but it was rejected, put on the shelf, and we had to wait 50 years until this condition was recognised. Um, it certainly did, um, you know, deal with the very difficult prejudice barriers we were up against, but it was only just a mere assault on the situation, I'm afraid, because we didn't really make a great deal of progress, and it's been very, very slow on how we um, help autistic people out in society, autistic adults, and autistic children. Now, just to tell you about, I worked for the civil service back in 1991. Um, it was the following year. They didn't have what was called the Disability Discrimination Act, 1992. I was sacked because there was no reasonable adjustments in those days. They didn't exist. So there was no reasonable adjustments to accommodate my neurological condition, or as people said in those days, learning disability. But I'm glad to stand shoulder to shoulder with Janine, who's going to speak later, to say that it's not a learning disability. And I think that's something we need to educate society on, because in actual fact, autistic people do have uh, talents, and they do have potential, and I think it's important that we support them in our society and how we go forward. Um, now, what, what it was, I didn't get any support, even from welfare, but I got support from the trade union, believe it or not. They actually got me back into the civil service, only they stuck their necks out, and I have to say the most socialist reps of all, some of who are uh, very good comrades of Mark Sawaka from years back, who's now our general secretary, you know, uh, really did stick the necks out for me. And uh, I am paying back this gratitude to PCS Union. So I've been working very hard, doing personal cases up to employment tribunal, and even got as far as the National Executive Committee, being in TUC a delegate, spoke at conference, or even stood as Labour councillor back in 2005 but I've been more swamped with trade union duties, and I didn't do too badly. 1,500 votes ago in a Tory uh, ward. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the, rea the grim reality is that discrimination still continues against autistic neurodivergent people. I mean, despite the fact that we had a landmark case, Hewitt versus Motorola in 2004, which declared dismissal of an autistic employee as <coughs> unlawful, uh, today only 16% of autistic people have full-time employment, and a further 9% are in part-time employment due to the institutionalised prejudice of employers. Um, the terrible reality also is that many employers have got prejudices against reasonable adjustments. They think it's a burden in terms of costs, investment, and we even have Tory councillors thinking they're a burden on the taxpayer. And how we have to reform and change and radicalise society, I think we've got a long way to go. But I'm proud to be part of a political party called Labour that is the first party to endorse autism neurodiversity in its manifesto. And I think it's about building on that. <laughs> Under this terrible Tory government, benefits actions, and of course you'll read more detail in our autism neurodiversity manifesto. We've, we've had copies of giving them out on the table, but we certainly have them on our website. Cuts to social care and housing have driven autistic people to suicide, autistic school leavers in their transition to adulthood, talk of falling off a cliff as support services come to an end. Bullying and hate crime increase with the demonisation of disabled claimants by the media. Um, and I make these points clear as a PCS member, a National Executive Committee, uh, our largest government department is the Department of Works and Pensions. And I'm sure when Mark, our General Secretary, speaks, he'll give you some more detail about the brutal realities <coughs> against disabled people that are occurring, including autistic people. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to make quite clear, and someone else, I think it's Emma, is going to speak in more detail on this, but profiteers and quacks exploit the fear of autistic people by marketing false and dangerous treatment for cures. Well, what a disgrace. And how is that an example to employers, when especially when you've got so many of the world's top politicians involved in this idea of cure for autism, an absolute disgrace, because no such cure exists. Why not say uh, we have a cure for people of different sexual orientation? And we think that's a disgraceful prejudice, and the same applies for anybody who's autistic or neurodivergent. Uh, it's vital to develop the Autism Act that includes obligation on, on employers. There needs to be education and training about autism and neurodiversity at all levels for political decision makers, employers, administrators of justice, education, staff, public service providers, parents, and so on. Um, I'm talking about reasonable adjustments, and I'd like to commend, of course, Janine, who did a very good uh, generic reasonable adjustment plan, a TUC Guide to Autism, back in 2014. And I think that's a very good reasonable, generic reasonable adjustment plan to follow. Although all, each autistic person is an individual, 
we have to bear that in mind and we have to understand what their personal individual needs are when they're interviewed. We also have to look about interviews, how we structure interviews, how we make interviews more autistic friendly. And I'm quite frankly, um, I'm disgusted with what's going on. They're still using some of the old fashioned type interviews in the civil service, mm -hmm. our employer, you know, even going back to the days of paperboard, uh, uh, not sorry, paperboard, but sort of like a board meeting, which can actually put autistic people under a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and neurodivergent people too. Um, also, the fact is, um, another issue I really wanted to raise, and of course you can read about the Generic Reasonable Adjustment Plan, it's on the website. Because time was a factor, I didn't want to go into too much detail about that. But there was one thing I did want to add. It's not just reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act. The employer owes you a duty of care under health and safety. Now tomorrow I'm going to the National Hazards Campaign Committee meeting in Manchester. I'm on the National Health, um, health and Safety Committee for PCS. And I think that the reality is we have to understand that if an employer owes you a duty of care, that means they have to give you a reasonable adjustment regardless. Because, you know, taking an employer on in terms of a grievance, you've only got three months before you go to an employment tribunal. In terms of personal injury claim, you've got five years. So I, I think that's an important issue to add in terms of reasonable adjustments, how we can improve the working lives of autistic people. Uh, the other point is understand that they need to be included. We have to understand what their issues are, what their problems are. Uh, we have to uh, have a very be more educated on this because sadly that isn't the case. And it was very brutal in my day and age as a child. People had never even heard what autism was. Uh, people just thought you were brain damaged or you used to all the other derogatory terms as well, which was quite brutal to think. Um, I've said covered quite a lot of ground and I have to allow for other speakers and I think that's important. Um, I just wanted to conclude. I mean, it was actually, I have to thank trade unionism and socialism for where I am now in PCS and I'm proud to be a member of the Labour Party as well, probably the only socialist party that exists and thanks to Jeremy Corbyn who's resurrected and John McDonald. I'm sorry I didn't want to leave you out John, um, and very important that is. Um, I just want to be quite clear, um, we can proudly say as we are the only political party to include the needs of the autistic neurodivergence of people in our manifesto. It's also true that we should encourage autistic people or neurodivergence to be active in the trade unions in order to represent their diverse workforce. And lastly, if we are serious in tackling the prejudice of our society, we must encourage autistic neurodivergent people to stand as councillors, regional assembly members and members of parliament in our forthcoming elections I make this point quite clear because the more we have, the more we can change society, the more we can educate. I'll conclude by saying solidarity. Yeah.